I heard someone say recently uh, these words. They said, um, if the God that you are reading about never shocks or challenges you, then the chances are that you're just reading about a reflection of yourself rather than about the true gods. Let me say that again. They said, if the God that you're reading about never shocks or challenges you, then the chances are you're just reading about a reflection of yourself rather than about the true gods. Well, 2 Samuel chapter 6 is one of those chapters of the Bible that is meant to stop us in our tracks, that is meant to make us pause and rethink exactly how we view God, exactly how we view God and exactly how we think about what it means to be able to come into his presence and exactly what the kind of leadership is that he is looking for. We're going to see it's very different to what we assume. All of these things are very different to the default ways that we often think about it. Because last week we started in the book of 2 Samuel. Uh, whenever it was, three years ago, we were in the book of Joshua. And then this time, uh, two years ago, we were in the book of Judges. And then this time last year, we were in the book of 1 Samuel. Now we're in 2 Samuel. It may well be, if the Lord doesn't return, we'll be in the book of 1 Kings and then 2 Kings. We'll see that whole run of the Bible through. But for now, we're in the book of 2 Samuel. And in simple terms, you could say 2 Samuel is a, a book with one central character. One central character at the heart of the whole thing, that being King David. And you probably don't need to know much about the Bible to know that King David is held up in the Bible's estimation as the, the greatest of all of the kings of the Old Testament. He is the original and greatest Messiah. That's the word used of him. Messiah it means literally God's anointed one. It's the word that in the New Testament is translated into the word Christ. So that it will come as no surprise to us as we read through 2 Samuel, as we read through 1 Samuel, we're going to see lots of different perspectives on, lots of portraits of, lots of shadows of the Lord Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of everything that the Messiah was supposed to be about and is supposed to be about. It's a book with a central character, that is David, and it's a book that splits into three big chunks as whoever it was wrote to Samuel, they carefully put their material together. They didn't just sort of splurge a load of events onto a page. They wove it together into a careful narrative to make clear points. And like I say, it's a book of uh, three thirds. The end, we know this because the end of the first third, you can see it. Turn to chapter 8 and verse 15. If you flick there, you see between verses 15 and 18... There's a little sort of summary section of life in David's kingdom, a summary that's given through a list of all of the key figures in authority in David's kingdom. You can see verse 15. So David reigned over all Israel and David administered justice and equity to all his people. Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was, uh, was over the army and Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was recorder. And it goes on. A summary of, uh, of the kingdom of God at that moment. But then you flick on to chapter 20 and verse 23, just a few pages on, and you see between verses 23 and 26, again, a very similar summary of who's in charge in the kingdom. It's a very strong echo. It's almost exactly the same. You start at verse 23. Now Joab was in command of the army of Israel. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiah, was in command of the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and Adoram was in charge of the forced labor. But as you read, you may have noticed one key omission and one troubling addition. The key omission is, of course, that David isn't there in the second summary. In the first summary, he's there as one who administers equity and justice and righteousness. At the end of the second summary, he's not there at all. And the troubling addition is that now we've got someone who's in charge of forced labor. You see, the way the book's structured is, in simple terms, the first third is all about how great it is in David's kingdom. And the second third is about what it's like when it all goes wrong. But for now, we're in the first third. That's where our passage is this morning. And we're going to see uh, David's continued rise to the throne of Israel and the moment that he brings in the very presence of God to his kingdom with all of the blessing that flows out from that. And we're going to see he's exactly the leader that God's people needs, which is great for us to just 
spend time in this portrait will be good for our souls anyway. But as last week we saw, we're in a moment where the wider Christian culture is in some degree of crisis because of the failures of Christian leadership that have been seen nationally and internationally. And so these words will come as a tonic to us in the midst of that crisis. But also, as Aislinn prayed, we're in the middle of voting season. This week, many of us will vote for leadership in uh, the Mayor of London race. Uh, Our natural expectations of leadership will come to the fore as we think about who we're going to vote for. So again, to see the leadership that God loves will do us good in these moments. And so now we're going to have our first reading. We're going to have three readings across the course of this morning. This is our first one coming up as we get to enjoy what life in God's kingdom really looks like. Our first reading is taken from 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 17 to 25. That's 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 17 to 25. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. But David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim, and David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. And David came to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. And he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breaking flood. Therefore, the name of that place is called Baal Perazim. And the Philistines left their idols there. And David and his men carried them away. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, You shall not go up. Go around their rear and come against them opposite the balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then rouse yourselves. For then the Lord has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. And David did as the Lord commanded him, and struck down the Philistines from Geba to Gezer. Back in chapter 5 verse 10, just a few verses before Sarah started reading there, we're told just how good David is. Chapter 5 verse 10, David became greater and greater, for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. This is where David is in God's estimation at the moment, and his kingdom is great. And the verses that Sarah just read give us a couple of David's greatest hits, as it were, two of his great victories in battle. If you were putting this into a film, it would be a, it'd be a montage section of David defeating God's enemies and acting as God's perfect king. He goes to battle against the, the Philistines, and the Philistines in these stories represent really the epitome of God's enemies. They are the most hostile force against God's people. There's nothing attractive about the way they live their lives and they constantly want to hurt and harm God's people and God's king. But David is the perfect king because he goes out to battle for his people and wins the victory, protects his people and provides for his people. But what's so striking, did you notice in in this account of these victories, is that David is not a a sort of independent, super strong, self-sufficient king who goes out to battle in his own strength. No, quite the opposite. He is a picture of dependence upon God. So verse 19, before he goes out to battle, David inquired of the Lord. And then again in verse 23, when David inquired of the Lord. David is God's perfect king because David is so perfectly dependent upon God. He does nothing without asking God in the first place. But when he asks God, God says, I'm going to be for you. I'm going to give you this victory. And not only will I give you guidance in the battle, but it's almost as though he says, I'll fight the battle for you. This is what we need most of all in God's king. We need someone who, as it were, can can channel the very presence and power of God on our behalf to bring in the victory that we need and to enable God's presence to dwell among us. Because in the story of 2 Samuel, that's what's significant about these battles. 
Uh, what David achieves by defeating the Philistines on these two occasions is that he, he, as it were, clears out a section of territory held by the Philistines that means all of a sudden David is able to bring the Ark of the Covenant from where it's been into the city of Jerusalem. Strikingly, the last time we heard about the Ark of the Covenant was back in 1 Samuel chapter 6, 70 years ago. 70 years before this, it had been parked up and put to one side and not mentioned again. But now as David achieves these victories, he thinks, this is the moment I can bring the Ark of the Covenant of God back into the city. Now, if you're listening and thinking to yourself, what, what is this Ark that he keeps going on about? I know about Noah's Ark, but that doesn't sound like what he's talking about. Well, you're right, it's not. The Ark of the Covenant was a, a, a great big box, a kind of chest, if you like that Moses had been told to build for the people of God. It was a beautiful construction. Had on top of it uh, little um, statues of angels, cherubim. And inside it contained the Ten Commandments and one or two items of significance to the national life of Israel. And in their best moments, the presence of God dwelt in and on this box, the Ark. So that the Ark of the Covenant for the people of God represents nothing less than the very presence of God dwelling among his people. And now David knows, as he achieves these victories, he is in a position to do exactly that. To bring the very presence of God back into the life of the people of God. And so what he does is, well he organises this amazing procession. Uh, chapter 6 verse 1 it says there David gathered all the chosen men of Israel 30,000 of them and then we're told in in verse 5 David and all the house of Israel were making merry before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. Imagine the Notting Hill Carnival. Okay that's the kind of scene that David is is pulling together for this moment as the presence of God comes in and you can imagine the buzz of excitement uh, and the energy that there would have been and the sense of expectation for the nation of Israel God's presence is coming back in to our national life and then something happens that is totally unexpected that literally stops the people of God in their tracks and makes them rethink exactly what they think about God and exactly what they think about God's King. So we're going to have our next reading. Our second reading is taken from 2 Samuel Chapter 6, verses 1 to 11. That's Second Samuel, chapter 6, verses 1 to 11. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah, to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of Hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the Ark of God. And Ahio went before the Ark. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edam and all his household. 
Verses 6 to 8 of the section that we just read are, are like the equivalent of the sound of smashing glass at a party. Um, you ever been in that moment where there's a lovely buzz, people are enjoying talking and, uh, and, and enjoying each other's company and then someone just drops a glass and something smashes on the other side of the room and silence falls and everyone turns to see exactly what the problem is. Well, that's like this moment for the people of Israel. The place where this episode happens with Uzar is given a name. Perez Uzar, uh, because the Lord burst forth against Uzar. But that name is meant to throw us back a few verses earlier to the place where God wins the battle, Baal Perazim. There are intentional uh, similarities between the two. Baal Perazim and Perez Uzar were meant to sort of compare and contrast these two episodes uh, to each other. We're thinking to ourselves, Baal Perazim, it's a wonderful thing when God bursts forth against the enemies of the people of God. But now in this moment, we're thinking to ourselves, God has just burst forth against his own people. And honestly, we share, I think, as the reader, something of David's frustration, something of God, uh, David's anger against God. This is, this is not how it's supposed to be, we think to ourselves. Has God lost the plot, we think? Has he flown off the handle for no particular reason? But when you read this story a bit more closely and take your time over it, you realise all of a sudden this is not this is not a picture of a fickle, hot-headed God who just flies off the handle randomly and unpredictably in a way that means we should be terrified he might do that to us one day. Now when we read more closely we begin to understand that this is a picture of the, the high and holy, pure and righteous God who must be approached properly and reverently. You see, the last time we saw uh, the Ark of the Covenant being literally carted around was back in the beginning of 1 Samuel. When the Philistines, they win a battle and they get to claim the Ark of the Covenant for themselves. But they realise being in the presence of God when you're God's enemy is a terrible, terrible thing and everything goes wrong for them. And so they do their best to get rid of the Ark of the Covenant. They, they strap it to a, a cart and they tie it to some oxen and then they sort of just encourage the oxen away because they want to get rid of the Ark of the Covenant. And now here we see the Ark of the Covenant strapped to a cart again. But if you read Numbers chapter 4, an earlier book of the Bible, you see there's some very clear, quite detailed instructions for exactly how the Ark of the Covenant is supposed to be carried around. It's a very careful, very methodical process with priests right at the heart of it. That's the way the people of God are supposed to treat the presence of God. But now here they are acting just like the Philistines without a care in the world. And you remember from the battles we saw a moment ago that the common feature is that whenever David does anything significant, he inquires of the Lord. But in this moment, there's no inquiry at all. There's no prayers. It's the right thing to do, the right moment to do it, the right way to do it. David just cracks on. And the name of the guy he puts at the heart of the procession, Uzar, well, maybe it just gives us a clue that David has begun to get a bit ahead of himself because Uzar literally just means strength. This parade that we're reading about... It's the equivalent of, imagine, a, um, you know, it's the Queen's birthday. It's one of the big birthdays where we kind of arrange a, a parade on the streets of London and the BBC covers it with Hugh Edwards doing the commentary and the people line the streets with their Union Jacks and there are brass bands playing all over the place. It's a great celebration. Imagine you have one of those parades, but the people organising the parade say to arrange for the transport of the Queen, they get a white transit van in. And they, they kind of get some rope and they tie a deck chair to the top of the white transit van. And they say to you, you know, there's a guy called Gary leading the procession. And they say, Don't, Your Majesty, Gary's going to give you a leg up. You sit on the deck chair. Everything will be just fine. And, uh, and don't worry, because if you feel wobbly at any point, Gary's on one side, Dave's on the other side. They'll catch you if anything goes wrong. Don't you worry about it. And Her Majesty the Queen goes down this parade strapped to the top of a white transit van. Now, you can get as many people as you want to that parade. You can get the best brass bands in the world playing. Her Majesty the Queen will not feel honoured or revered by heading down that parade on the top of a white transit van. Well, this is the mistake that David and the people of Israel have made. They have forgotten that the high, holy, pure God must be treated rightly on his own terms. And if you approach him wrongly, then the results can be devastating. 
I read these verses and think how often I make that mistake myself. I forget exactly what God is like and what is required to approach him. Well, and I'm not thinking about it. I default to thinking about God as being a bit like, you know, your sort of hippie uncle, the cool uncle that you have. Yeah, you've got your, your, your parents and obviously they have their rules and their ways of doing things and they can be a bit stuffy and uptight. You've got to live like that in their house. But when you get to go and hang out at your cool uncle's house, anything goes. He says to you, yeah, yeah, you come and go as you please. Come whenever you want, go whenever you want. And when you're here, just chill out. Let's hang out together. Let's have fun. Bring your mates along. They can get up to whatever you want. I default to thinking that God is like that, like that cool uncle. I can just come and go from his presence whenever I want. And he's pretty indifferent, pretty relaxed about the life that I lead and how I conduct myself. But the simple fact is that the God as, uh, God as the Bible portrays him is not like that. The God of the Bible is holy and pure, perfectly righteous. He's pictured as being like a consuming fire, fire that you're drawn towards to one degree, but at the same time, fire that you are afraid of and that you don't mess with. And to our, to our kind of 21st century relativistic ears, when, when we hear that, first of all, we, we bulk against it. We think to ourselves, that sounds a bit stuffy. It sounds a bit uptight. It sounds a bit uncompromising. But then you think about it for a while and you think, actually, it's a really amazing thing that God is like that. It's a wonderful thing that he's like that. Because we live in a world that is so chaotic, that is so unrighteous and unjust. Uh, we live in a world that is all over the place. And if there is not at the heart of that universe a God who is pure, perfect, righteous and who cares about what is right and will act in accordance with what is right, if that God is not at the heart of the universe, then this universe has no hope whatsoever. But to have a God like that at the heart of the universe does create a real problem for you and for me and for everyone else. It's a problem that David acknowledges as he speaks in verse 9. David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? How, how can I enjoy, how can we enjoy the presence of God? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David, but David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittites. Within the story, everyone is stopped in their tracks, and the ark of the covenant is put to one side for a time. Everything is paused while they wait for a signal from God to say, let's go again. And that signal does come as blessing is poured out on the house of Obed, Eden, the Gittites, a sign that God really does want to bless, that that is at the heart of his character. And so the procession begins again, but this time with a very different approach, as now we see the king who really can bring in the presence of God. Our third reading is taken from 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 12 to 23. That's 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 12 to 23. And it was told King David, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edam and all that belongs to him, because of the ark of God. So David went, and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edam to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. 
And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed among the people the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, a keg of bread, a portion of meat, and a keg of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed, each to his house. And David returned to bless his household. But Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How the king of Israel honoured himself today, and covering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. And David said to Michal, It was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord. And I will celebrate before the Lord. I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in your eyes. But by the female servants of whom you have spoken, by them I shall be held in honour. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. So the procession restarts, but this time with at least one very significant difference. Did you see verse 13? Verse 13, it says there, When those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, David sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. You get it again, verse 17 and verse 18. They brought, in the, uh, they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. It's become obvious through the incident with Uzar that, that sinful human beings can't just barge their way into the presence of God, can't just reach out and, as it were, touch God's. Our, our, our sin makes us unacceptable to God. We can't just barge into his presence. The sin needs to be atoned for if we're going to dwell with a holy God. Because again, God, God can't just turn a blind eye to it. it. That would be a huge miscarriage of justice if he said, I'm just going to ignore it. I'm just going to sweep it under the carpet. It's all right. Come on in. Come and be with me. No, sin must be atoned for. But the story of the Bible has atonement right at its heart. As God provides for the people what are called sacrifices of atonement. God outlines a system with animals at the heart. He says to the people of God, through the priests of God, look, I want you to sacrifice these animals. They will die to make atonement for the sin that you have been committing. So that as the animal dies, you might be forgiven your sins and might enjoy my presence. David recognises this. If the holy God is going to come into and dwell among the presence of his people, Animals will have to die as sacrifices. And so he's very careful and makes sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice as they make their way along this procession. But what's so striking in this moment, maybe even what's new in the Bible story, is David's involvement in these sacrifices. I said before, didn't I, that it's normally the priests who make these sacrifices. But here is David. At verse 14, we're told, David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. Now, again, you might have just read over that, thinking that's just describing his, his, his attire for the day. But a linen ephod is the kind of priestly garment that the priests should wear when they're making the sacrifices. You would forgive David for just stepping back for this whole, from this whole thing for a while. Uh, for being a, a bit distant, perhaps going a bit further back in the parade and sort of being lifted up on his own chair and wearing his own kingly robes and crown and just keeping his distance while others go into the, the danger zone. But here is David as God's true king saying, no, I am going to be the one who goes into the danger zone. I am going to be the one who makes the sacrifice of atonement on behalf of the people. A few weeks ago, uh, Susie and I uh, watched uh, the TV program Chernobyl. Uh, if you are feeling a bit fragile because of lockdown, I recommend you don't watch Chernobyl. Because honestly, it's pretty harrowing stuff. 
Um, don't worry, I'm not going to give any plot spoilers. It's happened. It's on records. It's about a nuclear power station that, that blows up. Uh, you know about it. It's a, it's a big part of history. And it blows up, and the, the literally the, the fallout is huge. The nuclear fallout is huge. And every episode, you see person after person, most often consciously, making a decision literally to step into the danger zone to walk into the area around that power station and to do things that require huge courage because they know if they don't do that, thousands, maybe millions of people will die as a consequence. And so it is the story of act of courage after act of courage as people lay down their lives by stepping into the danger zone so that thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people can be saved. Well, we get a brief glimpse here of what God's true king is like. He is a king who says, I will step into the danger zone myself. And when we see the fulfillment of this story, we see a king who says, I'll step into the danger zone myself and I will make a sacrifice, not of an animal, which could never really make atonement for human sin. He says, I will sacrifice myself. I will lay down my life so that millions of people might enjoy the presence of God that they just do not deserve. And as Jesus does exactly that, so he makes it possible for you and I to enjoy the very presence of God in our lives now and one day fully and finally forever. And honestly, as I say those things, again, maybe like me, you fall into the trap of thinking that's an easy thing to say, that's an easy thing to enjoy. We assume that things like uh, the indwelling of God's spirit in our lives, uh, which is a real and present reality, the, the power of God expressed in our day-to-day -day lives as he transforms us into the likeness of Jesus Christ. That reality or other realities, like the fact that even now we can hear the voice of God speaking to us through the scriptures, that we can experience things like the, the assurance that comes through the Holy Spirit pressing uh, forgiveness of sins onto our hearts, the peace of God that surpasses understanding, the joy of the Lord, all of these things that represent, or, or more than that, that express the reality of God's presence in our lives. All of these things, plus the future that we're looking forward to when we will dwell perfectly, fully and finally in the in the, the complete presence of God. All of these things we talk about and, and are maybe familiar with, we begin to think that maybe they were easy things to achieve. We forget just how big a deal it is that you and I can enjoy the presence of God and just how much it costs for that to happen. That it costs nothing less than the self-sacrifice of the ultimate priest king when he came. And indeed that it costs nothing less than the self-humbling of the honoured king. See, that's the other prominent feature of this parade as we're told about it, isn't it? It's the self-humbling of David. Again, it's one of those stories as you read it, it's slightly awkward to read, isn't it? Slightly embarrassing looking at David's behaviour. There is no, there, there's no pomp and ceremony from him. He's not wearing all of his royal robes. He's not got the crown on his head. You might expect him to be kind of lifted up and carried on a, on, on a beautiful chair by priests or other figures as, as he becomes the centre of attention. But there's absolutely none of that. Instead, he's simply dancing around naked or semi-naked at least and shouting at the top of his voice. It is awkward and embarrassing and Mikkel, his wife, wife she hates it verse 16 as the ark of the lord came into the city of david michael the daughter of saul looked out of the window and saw king david leaping and dancing before the lord and she despised him in her heart and so like a teenage girl who's just had to watch her dad dancing at a disco she approaches david to give her a piece uh, to give him a piece of her mind you see verse 20 David returned to bless his household, but Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how the king of Israel honoured himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. She says to David, David, today you had all the dignity of a flasher. That's what she thinks when she sees David acting in this way. But she's making the mistake that, again, I think you and I often make. 
when she looks for a king worthy of her esteem, worthy of her worship, worthy of her trust, she is looking for someone who is surrounded by all of the trappings of power. She is someone who looks good to the eye. But God is most concerned for the attitude of that king. That's what he looks for and loves most of all. And here in these verses, we see a king who is humble and dependent and who delights to give praise and glory to God, his father. You see verse 21 as David responds to Michal. David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord. And I will make merry before the Lord. I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in your eyes, but by the female servants of whom you have spoken, by them I shall be held in honour. David says, yeah, I'm contemptible. I'm contemptible in your eyes, and maybe in the eyes of the world. I'll become more contemptible even than this. And that's because I am dancing for the audience of one. I'm dancing before the Lord. He's the one whose estimation I care most about. He is the one I am most devoted to in praise and honour and glory. And Mikkel despises him because she wants a leader who conforms to her expectation. Twice David says, doesn't he, you're you're Saul's daughter. Let's not forget that. You are a daughter in your father's image. Saul was a king who was all about appearances. He looked good. He was head and shoulders above the rest. He was handsome and led with strength. But in the end, he was unconcerned with God and what he said. She says, you're looking for that. You've got a worldly pattern of leadership. Mikkel is very much following in the footsteps of characters that uh, if you've read the intervening chapters, you'll see Joab and Abner. We haven't had time to look at them in our series working through, but the point that their chapters make is exactly the same. Joab and Abner are two military figures who want to see David rise to the throne, but through using worldly power play and, and all kinds of demonstrations of strength. Their story in the chapters before this and Mikkel's story and indeed Uzar's story, it's the same story again and again and again. The chapters make the same point. Human beings, naturally, if we're left unchecked, we will look for a king surrounded by the trappings of power and we will look to elevate that king through power play and politics. The different workings of the same attitude. We want a king who looks like how we want him to look and who does things our way. But David says, to Samuel says, God says, my king will look contemptible and weak and humble. And if you don't get that about God's king, you'll hate him when you see him. But if you've got eyes to see it, you will think it is beautiful. And he's saying, my king's kingdom will be great. It will be the greatest of all of the kingdoms. But if you don't get that, you will always find that kingdom to be in your face and offensive. But if you do enjoy it, well, you will follow in the footsteps. The kingdom that you will inhabit will be a kingdom characterised by weakness and strength and brokenness. We thought about that at our annual vision meeting on Wednesday. But it will be a kingdom in which you enjoy the very presence and power and blessing of God himself. Philippians chapter 2 verses 8 to 10. They're verses that we know and love at at Crossway. It says this, speaking of Jesus Christ, the fulfilment of these verses. Philippians 2 verse 8 says, being found in human form, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I will become even more contemptible than this. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. You see, that's God's king in his fullest expression. He is nothing like what we would expect, and he is everything we need. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for these stories so rich in detail, inspired by your Holy Spirit to deepen our grasp of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes. We thank you, our Father, that that when Jesus Christ came, he did bring in your presence. 
He made it possible through his death and resurrection for you and I to enjoy dwelling with you now by your Holy Spirit in our lives, by the presence of each other in our lives. And one day fully and finally when we will share in your glory, when we will dwell with you and your son perfectly forever. We're, we're so grateful for that promise and that reality as we live in this world so broken as it is by human sin. And we praise you, Lord, that actually in the end, the kingdom of God is not a kingdom characterized by human strength and wisdom and power, but by your strength and your wisdom and your power, a power that is expressed in the first instance in weakness. Lord, we find that really hard to get our heads around and to live in the light of. I confess I find it hard myself, but I know when I see it, it's beautiful. So I pray for us, Lord, that we would embrace this pattern so that we embrace your king day in, day out, living in his footsteps and enjoying the blessings that he has brought in and will bring in fully and finally one day. And we ask all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. Great. Welcome back, everyone. We're going to have a quick question time now for around 10 minutes or so. We'll see how we're doing, but it'll be reasonably um, bish bash bosh. And the first question is to do with us having skipped a couple of chapters so you'll have noticed we did what was it one and two last week we've done five and six this week yeah what, roughly what, what, what yeah why the skip yeah so um oh, i mean there's, there's a few different reasons i won't go into them all but a certain amount of prag pragmatic thinking goes into when and how we divide up the sections in a series uh, if we we're going to preach to samuel if we we're going to sort of give due attention to every verse and every section then you could justify a year in two samuel so as long as you say, well, we're not going to give a year because we want to have a mixed diet of books of the Bible in our preaching. Uh, we're going to pick, say, two to three months to go through it. Well, then, then you're starting to say, well, look, what can we cover and what can't we cover? And one of the reasons we haven't picked up on these intervening chapters is because, in a sense, the message is a very similar one. I talked about it at the end of the sermon. Abner and Joab, the key figures, represent, I think, the same or it's different different. Um, outworkings of the same attitude that we see in Michal and in, in, in Uzar. Uh, that is to say, they are people who are uh, they're political power players who want to see David elevated to the throne on their terms and through their ways of doing things. And so in order to give more time to later chapters of the Bible, we've gone over those verses. Uh, well, we've not, we've not read them. But that's going to happen again during the series. There will be bits we don't read or can't pay attention to in the preaching. There's, there's, some of those are just judgment calls. Where do we put the emphasis? Where don't we? We can't do it all. We may not get those calls right every time, uh, but there's a degree of kind of care and attention to the text that drives those decisions as we go. Great. Uh, gritty, practical questions. So lots of questions about the ark and the kind of approachability of God and having a right reverence for God, that sort of thing. Uh, how might that work out today? And then a very practical one um, about praying on the loo. Is, is that OK? <laughs> yeah, yeah, great question. Um, Oh, look, we've got to be careful in understanding that when we see all of the, the, the ceremony and the structure of the Old Testament, whether it's the sacrificial system that you see something of today or the priestly uh, system that we also see, um, that the New Testament is, is clear that all of that finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. He's the perfect sacrifice. He's the perfect priest. Everything the temple represented, the Ark of the Covenant represented, the tabernacle, it's all fulfilled in him. So it, it mustn't be the case that we try to replicate Old Testament religion in our spiritual practices where we have temple buildings and special holy places and, uh, uh, and uh, sort of sacrifices of atonement in whatever way we might think about making them. That's all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So as we come to him, we get it all. So we want a spirituality and practice that is really focused in on him and life in him and that feeds off him. Uh, now, that's not to say we shouldn't take some of the lessons from here to do with uh, reverence and awe and fear. The New Testament is as clear as the Old Testament that God is a God who is to be feared. Uh, fear him who can, uh, who can throw your life into hell, says Jesus Christ himself. And so when it comes to our approach to God, it is right that we do so with a reverence and an awe and a care. Uh, that as we hear his word and, and his voice speaking to us, we do so carefully and, and reverently with a desire to live in the light of what he says. Uh, as we come to his people, 
in whom he dwells and live with each other. We do so carefully and lovingly. We don't play fast and loose with the church at all. The, the, the very dwelling place of God in the, in the present day, the new temple of God. Uh, we're not relaxed about uh, how we approach the church family or how we approach generally. We do so with a reverence and an awe that speaks of our God. This is new covenant religion and how it works out and the echoes are the same. Sorry, so to, uh, to, to get into the really nitty gritty, should you pray on the toilet? I guess the person's asking, is it possible to, it, does that speak of a reverence for God's? Well, let me give you my personal take, and it might be as much to do with my conscience as anything. I, pers- I have thought about this in the past. Personally, I won't. I won't pray on the toilets because I think when I pray, I want my prayer life to be reverent and, uh, and careful in that way. And I don't personally feel like I can do that while I'm on the toilet. Others may feel like they can, and I certainly wouldn't want to play- put a rule in place. And I certainly wouldn't want to say you can only pray when you're settled, quiet, and in a peaceful place. We can pray to God at any time. It's one of the great blessings of the Christian life. When we're under pressure and feeling distracted, we can fire a prayer up. When we're walking along and enjoying a peaceful moment in the countryside, we can pray. Whatever it is, whenever it is, we can pray. But even then, that prayer should be marked out by a, a respect and a reverence in keeping with who God is rather than an indifference to him. Great, really helpful. Um, little book plug, which I think is really great in terms of fear in the New Testament and how that works out as a believer in the Lord Jesus. Rejoice and Tremble by Mike Reeves. Really good book. Um, quick question about King David acting as a priest. Saul acted as a priest in uh, 1 Samuel 13. And he was um, rebuked uh, very strongly for that. Mm. David's acting as a priest here. What's the difference? I think, I mean, you might want to add to this, but I think I preached that passage. You can go back and listen to it. It's more that um, the problem is that Saul didn't wait for Samuel and therefore Saul didn't listen to the commandment of the Lord. Uh, I think you get that as the rebuke comes. So it's not necessarily the priest issue, but the fact that he didn't wait for God's prophet to come. And he he acted against something the Lord had commanded him to do in waiting. Is that that helpful? Uh, They're not direct comparisons, actually. No, that's exactly right. That is exactly right. And actually, you do see across the course of the Old Testament, there are three key roles that you see, the prophets, the priest, and the the king. And you see all of those in 1 and 2 Samuel. And most normally, those three roles are inhabited in a distinct and particular way. But often, you do see a blurring between the two, the, uh, the, 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 the... I'm giving an example. Uh, Samuel himself, right. he's called a judge yep. in 1 Samuel. He's a prophet as well who's raised up. And yet in 1 Samuel 2, you hear that he's got a linen ephod on right. as he's growing up in the Lord. And you also hear him kind of mediating, interceding on behalf of the people in, yeah. is it 1 Samuel 7 and 1 Samuel 12 a bit as well. So there is a bit of mingling that sometimes happens. All right, all of which I think is meant to make us think that when we see the one who comes who is the, the perfect prophet, priest, king, that's the fulfilment of everything it's been pointing to. It's been driving towards one figure all, all along. Yeah, really helpful. And um, so... Just give us a little bit of a think now about, sorry, that doesn't even make sense. Give us a little bit of that. Contemptibility uh, and uh, the idea of uh, being contemptible in today's society. You said following in the king's footsteps. David mm. says, I'll become even more contemptible than this. We'll all think immediately of the Matt Redmond song if we're of a certain generation. What does that look like for a Christian following in those footsteps today, being undignified in this um, society as one of God's people? Yeah, that's a great question. One that would be really good to pick up and talk about more. Um, I, don't, I don't think in the first instance it means we need to come up with our own ways of, of, of trying to look as silly as we possibly can or to make dramatic gestures that have no spiritual significance in order to be contemptible. It certainly doesn't mean doing things that are, that, that are ungodly, that would, you know, winding people up so that they dislike us, or, or saying things on social media platforms that we know are just going to inflame so that we bring hatred and contempt upon ourselves. I think sometimes people mistake that. They think I could be bullish and careless, and the world will hate me, and in fact they're just being ungodly and unloving. But if we commit to um, loving Jesus' words and speaking Jesus' gospel, the promise he makes again and again is that like Michal responded to David, the world will respond with contempt. And I think we, we do know that. It's why we're instinctively nervous just to say the name of Jesus in, in, in our public settings that we're in. 
to talk about God himself becoming a human being sounds silly, born of a virgin sounds ridiculous. Uh, um, needing to make atonement for sin, increasingly an unpopular idea. And that's before you get into some of the, the, the more ethical sides of the Christian worldview. If we're resolved to, to believe those things and to speak about those things, then the world will hold us in contempt. And then I think you could add in, if we're going to make lifestyle decisions in keeping with that, sacrificial lifestyle decisions that are different to our peers, I think so many of my peers, they, they have catapulted up the lifestyle ladder and are living in totally different places and lifestyles to the lifestyle that, 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 that I live. And, and you will all know that. So if we make those decisions, they'll look at us and say, why on earth aren't you living the good life like I am, where I am? If I've got success, I know what your, I could guess what your salary is, but you're not doing that with it. Well, again, they'll, they'll hold us in contempt for it. So I think there's lots of ways that actually it, it will work out over time. Yeah, I think that's really helpful, particularly thinking about not just calling yourself a Christian and saying that you follow in the footsteps of the king, but um, aligning yourself with his words and letting his words drive everything that mm. you do. You see that particularly, don't you, mm. as we've been looking at in Crossway groups, that the apostles are persecuted, not just because they, they say they believe in Jesus, but they follow his words and they bring his words to bear on the culture. Yeah, um, yeah really helpful. Um, one final question, and then would you mind closing us in prayer? Mm -hmm. um, uh, you talked a lot about kind of bringing in God's presence, and this is the king who brings in God's presence. Uh, mentioned words like uh, joy and, and peace uh, and uh, the Holy Spirit dwelling in our hearts. Um, can you just help us a little bit more with that? Um, how do we go about enjoying God's presence today, um, that presence that the Lord Jesus has won for us? Yeah. Oh, it's a big question, and there's, there's lots of answers to it. But... Um, let me get us started. When, when we think about the Holy Spirit, um, who, who, in a sense, this is the, the most the, the, the way we enjoy God's presence in the first instance is by the Holy Spirit dwelling in our hearts. There are all sorts of confused ideas about the Holy Spirit. The, the most important idea, I think, to help us when thinking about the Spirit is to, to realize that he's the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So he's not an independent maverick third party doing his own crazy thing. He's the one God and he's the spirit of Jesus Christ. We've seen this in John 14, haven't we? So when the spirit comes to dwell in our lives, Jesus comes to dwell in our lives, the father comes to dwell in our life. So what are we expecting from that? How does that set our expectations? Because normally I think we would think, oh, the presence of God is gonna be about tingly feelings or crazy experiences. Now, it's not to say there won't be feelings, that there will, and wonderfully, I guess you probably know that. But actually, the, the, the powerful expression of the presence of God is going to be a close association with and transformation into the likeness of Jesus Christ. His presence is transformative. We saw that in 2 Corinthians 4. As we gaze on the face of Jesus Christ, we are being transformed from one degree of glory into another, into the likeness of Jesus. And so the presence of God in our life is going to be expressed by growing in Christ's likeness wonderfully. Uh, it's going to be expressed in sharing in his joy. We've seen that, haven't we, in John's gospel. They will share in my joy. Uh, it will be expressed in, a, in a, a, an ability to, to pray and enjoy uh, a closeness with the Father as we hear his voice speaking. The Father and the Son have in eternity been in this perfect love relationship expressed in, in loving words. Well, now we get to enjoy that as well. When you open the scriptures and know the love of God in Jesus Christ, you, you're enjoying the indwelling presence of God. That's an experience of the presence of God. And that's before we've got onto the corporate aspects of the presence of God. That being that I have the spirit of God in me, but so do you if you're a Christian so that when we're together I'm seeing Christ in you you're seeing Christ in me we're singing his praises and praying to him and hearing his voice and, and that's why church is so precious if you've come through this year and haven't got to the place of thinking church is so precious I'll never make it a, a lesser priority in my life again let me try one more time to persuade you church is when we together enjoy the presence of God because corporately we're so much more than we are individually and that moment on May the 23rd and every Sunday until uh, uh, until glory God willing we a moment when we come together as the temple of God to enjoy his presence among us Jesus Christ in each of us transforming us so consider that a trailer for May the 23rd and onwards. Wonderful. Would you pray for us, Jamie? Yeah, I'd love to. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for the way that Jesus Christ has, has made it possible. He's, he's, he's interceded and mediated a, between you and, uh, and us and made it possible for us to dwell with you now and forever. Help us to explore these ideas and push them further. Help us to understand, as we're in John's gospel, 
uh, what it means for us to be one as, as you are one. Help us to understand the unity that we have, the fellowship that we have, the joy that we can have in and through the Lord Jesus Christ and many other ways in which your presence manifests itself among us. Deepen our sense of these things, we pray, Lord, that again, our, our enjoyment of them might be all the more full and our commitment to them might be all the more full. Help us as we emerge from this period of lockdown to line our lives up and our priorities up with yours so that we might be your people following in the footsteps of your King. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.